Guys, I, I, I'm kind of humbled to be here. I really am. Um, I'm kind of an old fart, so I've got the, the stuff in my hair, the gray stuff now. Um, I sat in a lot of rooms like this. I still sit in a lot of rooms like this with, with cohorts of, of all kinds of, of professions, whether it's my, my physiotherapy colleagues or it's my coaching colleagues or my sports science colleagues. Um, but I've sat in a lot of these rooms and a lot of these conferences, and I've, I've never been a keynote speaker before, Mike. So uh, I, I had to look it up and see what a keynote was all about. And I think I looked it up and it said I'm supposed to be somewhat entertaining, so I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to make you laugh at least once. Uh, I'm supposed to encourage you and motivate you, and so you'll get the most out of the conference that follows. Uh, so this is a very different talk for me, and this is a talk that's very similar to the one that I use with my staff a lot. Um, it's one that I kind of am talking to myself, too, okay? I want you to understand something. I don't have any of the right answers. I don't. I should just be sitting right there, and I'm going to literally be preaching to myself with this next presentation, okay? I don't have it figured out. The, the title, Profession Forward, and, and I'm 20 years now into a, whatever this profession is, this sports performance profession. Am I part strength coach? I'm part physio. I'm part sports scientist. I'm part guru. Um, it's a cool profession, isn't it? Isn't it cool? Guys, if you don't think this is cool, you're in the wrong room, okay? We've got a cool profession. And I'm proud of it. I'm dang proud of it. And I'm also very protective of it. I don't like tourists. Okay? If you're a tourist, you're in the wrong room today. Okay? Okay? I don't see anybody getting up. But we have a fight to fight, guys. I have a fight to fight. I'm going to see if my clicker's going to work, guys. Mike, my clicker's not going to work, brother. I'll be your manual for Or I can just, if I can reach up here and hit the... I can do that too. It was working, I swear. But we are, we're in a fight, guys. We're in a fight. Not, like, not unlike any of our athletes are in a fight. We are all in a fight for our profession. I get to travel the world with my current job and it's been the most humbling experience I've ever had to be able to travel the globe and see just how much we need to fight for this profession. We have a problem here in the States. We're arrogant. We think we know it all. We think our stuff doesn't stink. We think we've got all the answers and the rest of the world is looking at us to just tell us what to do in your grand wisdom, United States. Guess what? Wrong. We are behind. I'm here to tell you, okay? It's tough to say because my arrogance starts to leak out a little bit. We are behind the rest of the world, okay? We got a lot of catching up to do. We have some fights to fight. This is Steve Prefontaine. He's a Nike icon. This is the attitude that I'm taking going forward. So I'm sitting in the chair. This is the attitude that I'm convicting myself of, that I'm aspiring to be. Okay? I'm going to be a cold-blooded assassin with the days that I have left for my profession, for me professionally. Okay? I'm not going to be a tourist. I'm going to take it deadly seriously. And if somebody's going to beat me, they're going to have to bleed to do it. That's a cold-blooded assassin on that wall right there, isn't he? He was a rebel. Okay. He changed the face of distance running for all of us. Okay. That's the attitude I'm going to take. And that's the attitude I want to convey to you today is it is a fight. Yes, this one works. This one works. Wrong clicker. Beautiful. Thank you, Mike. Get one up here. Look at that. This guy's a fighter too. Anybody know who this guy is? This is my business partner now. His name is Michael Johnson. For those young people in the room, uh, he was a pretty fast guy at one point. Okay. But I want you to look at that face. That's the face of a fighter. That's a face of a cold-blooded assassin okay, that is deadly serious about what he's about to do. That's his job, to run fast, to win gold medals. Okay? It's his job, and he takes it deadly seriously. You guys remember this moment? It still gives me goosebumps to see it, right? I get the pleasure of, of working with this guy daily. Okay? So the level of expectation that he has of himself is extreme. He didn't set out to win this race. You know, that wasn't his goal. He showed me his goal. It was on a piece of paper. What was his goal? Break the world record. There was no gold medal written on the goal. Break the world record was the goal. That's a reach. That's a stretch goal, right? That's aspirational. It's impossible. It's uncomfortable. It's sick, right? 
That's a sick individual. I've been around a lot of those over the last 20 years, and I want to share with you some of the things that makes them sick, is some of the things that also makes them great, and some of the things that we need to imbibe into our profession, every single one of us in some small way. This is where I live. This is where I work. This is McKinney. Anybody been to McKinney? This is our world headquarters in McKinney. I call it world headquarters now because we've got some others across the globe. I'll show you in a minute. We've got some cool toys. We've got some stuff. We don't have toys like this. I mean, this is unbelievable in here, right? Well, we've got some cool stuff. We've got some cool athletes that we train, kids all the way up to professionals and elites. That's Julius Randall. Anybody recognize Julius? University of Kentucky, he's training today. Just checked in on him. So we've got some pretty cool stuff, pretty cool athletes, cool equipment. I've even got a place in the UK now, St. George's Park, the FA Center of Excellence now, where we're actually doing programming there. Anybody know what the sport of soccer is? Is that something? Do you guys know what that is? That is the number one sport in the world, if you didn't know. Take football, basketball, and baseball and wrap it all up together, and it's not as big as this sport. Okay? So this is a pretty big deal. It's a pretty big campus, right? Unbelievable. I'm spoiled, aren't I? This is our spot in Geneva, Ohio. How many have been to Geneva before, to the Spire Institute there? One of the best indoor facilities in the world is up there. Unbelievable. Athletes of all ages, of all sizes, of all shapes. We get unbelievable people coming through our facility. And Dominican Sue, Darren McFadden, these are the freaks that we get to work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Freaky, freaky people. I'm spoiled. These are also some of the athletes that we get to work with. These little nine-year-olds with their tongue hanging out because they've come to us and said no to somebody else to get them better. I get so jazzed about that. Look at the look, at the look on that kid's face. Look at the look on the, the coach's face. That's what we're talking about today, is that coach. That coach just met that kid. That's not his kid. It's not on his team. He may never see that kid again. This may be the only rep that he gets with that kid the entire day is one test on a vertical jump. Look on that coach's face. Is it important to that coach? That's what we're talking about today, guys. That's the difference between being a tourist and being great. That kind of thing right there. You can't fake that. He cares, doesn't he? All ages and potentials. These are I mean, you've seen these kids before. We've got college athletes. It's unbelievable the people that come through our space. Over 20,000 training sessions just in McKinney, Texas alone last year. So we have a huge oasis of athletes continuously streaming through. We do this all day long, 8 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock at night. If you don't believe me, we've got an extern here. He'll, he'll be glad to talk to you about our hours. It's a constant stream of populace coming through there to do one thing, and that is to get better. And they trust us. The professionals are here. That's a group of our NFL offseason athletes. They're there looking for the same thing, just to improve. Elite teams, anybody know who Manchester United is? You may see some famous faces in that group photo right there. They come all the way across the, the pond to come work with us. Unbelievable, right? We even work with these little youth teams. Some unbelievable little snots in that group right there. All right? We get just as jazzed about helping them. We have systems and we have unbelievable ideology about how we attack athleticism. It's not what I'm here to talk about, guys. I'm here to talk about results. Boy, let's show you some of these cool graphs of this power output that we improve in this range of motion. I'm not here to talk about that either. Those are great, aren't they? Isn't that unbelievable? That's that man running against himself. That's the result we have to kick out for our, for our clientele all the time. That's what they come to expect. If they don't get it from us, they'll go right down the street to get it. Within a 10-mile radius of my facility, I've got about 100 gurus who will do it cheaper and promise them a better result. If I don't do it better, I go out of business. It's that simple. I've got to get those results, these results. Gosh, how do I do that? I hold myself to a higher standard is one. We're not getting results right now, guys. How many gold medals did we win in London, the London Games? 104, USA, USA. Per person in the United States? We're not even in the top 25. You think we're doing it right, guys? We're not. We are behind. We are losing the race. Wake up. That's the stuff that keeps me up at night. 49th. We have challenges. How am I going to leverage science to help me understand the body better? Body composition. Challenges around recovery. How am I going to recover my athletes better? What things am I going to leverage from the world to help my athletes recover? 
Am I going to freeze everybody? I don't know. We got a cryogenic chamber at, at MJP. Now I'm freezing people. I got to break some stuff to try to figure this thing out. This is a tough challenge, right? I got to leverage the science. And I'll show you in a minute some of our Nike uh, sponsorship that helps us unravel. Why? Is it just how high she jumps or is it how fast and how high? What's more important? I'm going to tell you right now. It's not just how high she jumps. And I used to stand up here and tell you it's all about vertical jump. It's not. I don't have the answer yet. I don't know what it is, but it's not just vertical jump. But that graph right there tells me it's not vertical jump. Keeps me up at night. Mysteries. Challenges of footwear. Anybody recognize that guy? He's a Texas sprinter, Marquise Goodwin, NFL comp. He came to us and said, we're going to create a shoe to break the NFL combine 40-yard dash record. What do we do? Well, you know, show me the shoes that you already have. No, 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 no. You tell us what makes somebody fast in the 40, and we will build a shoe from there. How about that? First ever 3D printed shoe right there. It was printed in 15 minutes. Bespoke to Marquise Goodwin's foot. Are you, are you kidding me? That's extreme edge kind of stuff, right? Now they got this new shoe coming out. You're going to see it. I don't know if you're, you're familiar with these, uh, these minimalist shoes that the uh, CrossFitters use. You're going to see some of that. That came out of a year of studying an MJP. Cool stuff, right? Bleeding edge type stuff. So what does Nike do? They set up to, to answer some of these challenges. Let's just set up an MJP. So they've set up one of these NSRLs at our spot. So now we're studying the science all the time. All these things. You can see where they came in and gutted. We're going we're gonna to stop sending athletes to a science place. We're going to bring the science to the athlete. So we're going to embed the science into MJP. We're going to study what you do all the time to help unravel some of these challenges. I have other challenges to meet. Right now we've got two facilities, or three facilities now. How do I do this across the globe? That's me in 2014 and 15. How do I replicate all these answers across the globe? You think the athletes here are the same as Angola? Wrong. You think they have the same challenges? Some, they have some very different challenges. It's hugely challenging. I've got to fight. I have got to fight. I have got to get better today for tomorrow or I will drop this ball. That's a big ball to drop too. What does it begin and end with? It begins and ends with a coach. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. I think we all consider ourselves coaches. I know I do. I consider myself a coach, a physical educator, and I'm dadgum proud of it, and I hope you guys are too. We have coaches. They're competent. They're cultivating. We're going to talk about a lot of these these ideas. These are some pictures of my coaches. That's a coach. Recognize him? He's our head coach, Michael Johnson. He's a coach. It begins and ends with people, not technology, not the latest and greatest rep set scheme on the internet. It begins and ends with people and coaches. So people, I think I asked all you guys, I think in your first page of your outline there, I asked you some questions about kind of what's your why. This was Steve Prefontaine's why. Why does he get up? Why is he a cold-blooded killer? Self-satisfaction and achievement. Those were his two big bullet points. That's why I do what I do. That's why I'm going to wear you out. Because I get the juice off of self-satisfaction and achievement. What is your why? Okay, so this is where it gets a little non-traditional. How many of you know the answer to this question? Why did you come to this point in your career? Okay, during the course of my talk, I'd like for you to write this down. And if you're too cool for school, if you think, well, that, that exercise isn't for me, there's the door. That's how deadly serious I am about this, guys. This exercise will help us all. Lance, it will help you to write this down, and I've done it. What is your why? Write down five reasons you are in this profession today. It doesn't have to be right now, but during the course of this, this lecture or other lectures, write these things down. Literally commit them to pen and paper. And then ask yourself some tough questions. Expose your own ego for a minute. Lance, is being good at this career good enough for you? Or do you aspire for greatness? And then name 10 characteristics of greatness. 10 things that spin off the top of your head that create greatness. Or that is about greatness. And I wish he'd talk about some speed training techniques, right? I'm sorry to disappoint you guys. I ain't talking about any of that crap. It's important. <laughs> Not as important as this. What are these 10 things? If you don't know them, I'm going to help you. I'm going to identify 10 that we've come up with. Okay? 
What is your challenge? What's going to limit your professional growth in the coming years? You got to identify those barriers. I'm going to tell you in a minute, those barriers, those are not in the way. Those are the way. I don't have enough equipment. I don't have enough funding. I don't have enough staff. That's the way. I'm telling you from experience, Lance, I'm telling you, that's the way, not in the way. Identify those challenges. And then ask yourself now, write down, this is important. Are you giving your athletes your best? And this speaks to this conference. As a keynote speaker, I'm trying to get more out of this for you to get more out of this conference. Write down three specific ways that attending a conference like this will affect your athletes. Will affect your athletes. That's the mindset we're going to come to these conferences. How am I going to leverage this to affect my athletes? This ain't about you, bro. It's about your athletes, isn't it? How are you going to leverage this for them? Okay. Write down three things that you're going to pull from this to leverage for them. Now write down three things that you never do at conferences like this. I never meet 10 people that I don't know. I never network beyond the conference. I never stay till the last speaker's done. I never stay pressed in the full hour that somebody's up there talking. Status, stats to say you're only going to remember 20% of what I say anyway. And it's already been about 20 minutes, so you've probably already tuned me out. Press in, right? And then finally, write down three specific things that you will recommit yourself to doing. And this is all in your handout. And I think this is a great exercise, guys. It's an exercise that convicted me. It convicted me, and it's helped me tremendously. And I hope that it helps you. We'll talk a little bit more after. So here's some stuff. This is a, a list of, of talks that came off the national, uh, the national Symposium or the National Conference, I think, last year. An unbelievable lineup, right? This is just like from 7 a.m. to 10.20. Balanced athlete functional movement workout. Training the post-rehab shoulder. CrossFit, friend or foe. Exercise, nutrition, strategy. Yeah! Here's some great people in the rooms that were there. Coach Huddy at Kansas. Look at all the stuff behind her name. I don't even know what some of those initials mean. I don't even know what it means, but it's impressive. You know what is also impressive is Mike Nitka's little ditty down there. What's the most impressive thing about Mike Nitka? It only took him two sentences, but it says 35 years of experience. Enough for me. Don't need an initial behind your name to tell me that. 35 years of experience. Those are great people, aren't they? That's some greatness right there. So you can get it. I was in a great room recently. And this is what I'm going to start to share with you is I've been, I've been really cursed with being put in some great rooms in some, with some great people that have convicted me. I was in a great room recently. This was this year in Doha. Anybody know where Doha is? Yeah, some people are like, oh, yeah. somewhere in the Middle East, right? Okay, so we're in the Middle East and uh, we're asked to be presenters. Michael and I are asked to be presenters at this conference. I have no earthly idea why they wanted me to present because I could tell right off the bat that I was way out of my depths. So it was after the first day, and they had us all as presenters attend this big delegate conference. And there was 500 delegates there, and we were all sitting down to have dinner. Uh, and after the dinner was over, they had a little mixing room for them, and they said, you know, you guys as presenters, we have you up in this special room to kind of hang out until we do some media. Oh, great. So I go up to this room, and this room is no bigger than this grouping of chairs right here. And in that room are these freaks. <laughs> it's kind of like the Where's Waldo Pick out the guy that doesn't fit, okay? It shouldn't be hard for anybody in this room to pick out who doesn't fit in that room. That was a huge room. Dame Kelly Holmes, Olympic champion. Wilson Kip Couture, world record holder. John McEnroe, some tennis player. Tony Hawk, he, I guess he rides skateboards. <laughs> Dikembe Mutombo. Bart Connor and Nadia Comaneci over there talking about the, the things they're gonna do when they get back to Norman. Boris Becker and Ilya Nastasi, they're arguing about some. This is the whole room, okay? A room of greatness, wasn't it? Those people are different. They do different things. They think differently. They were all blessed with some talent, but they do things differently. And I'm here to tell you, I'm going to share with you some of those things that I think we can steal from great rooms like this and from great people to apply to our profession. But make no mistake, great cultures begin with great coaches. Just got back from Trinidad and Tobago. Unbelievable fast Caribbean athletes. But they told me, you know, the reason we can't compete with Jamaica is that's just not our culture. We're just not a competitive culture. We don't have a high performance culture. Okay. What was the culture at Duke before Mike Krzyzewski was there? Anybody remember? 
I, I'm, not, I'm not even old enough to remember. It wasn't what it is now, was it? How did that culture begin? It began with great what? Coaches. It didn't begin with some big fundraiser. It didn't begin with some great weight room that we built or some unbelievable conference or continuing education course that we took. It began with a coach. And I'm here to tell you that's the culture. The culture creators are in the room now. And there's standing proof of it. So what makes a great coach? Anybody familiar with this movie? It's called Glen Gary, Glen Ross. It's not a very nice movie. I don't encourage you to watch it. It's not a family-friendly movie. Okay? But there's a pretty salient message that comes out of it. This guy's a vicious, wicked salesman. He's one of the best salesmen in their company. And he talks about A, B, C. Always be closing. I'm a salesman. I've got to always be closing. And he's trying to motivate a group of salesmen that are underperforming. And he keeps coming back to this A, B, C. Always be closing. We have some A, B, C's from great rooms that we can use to apply to our profession forward. I'm going to share some of those with you. But I'll start it with always a great coach must. And again, I preface this, right? If greatness is not for you, wait till the next speaker, okay? Because this is going to hurt your feelings. Lance, remember I'm sitting here. But a great coach must have some ABCs. Number one ABC, and this is my list of 10. This is the same 10 that I judge my coaches on. It's the same 10 that I judge myself on and have my coaches judge me on. Number one, they've got to be competent, right? That's one of the reasons why you're at this conference, is to improve your competency. The X's and O's of strength and conditioning, right? Squat techniques and golly, there's some sexy stuff on that. Man, it's unbelievable stuff you're going to have, right? The X's and O's of strength and conditioning. I looked through the NSCA's national convention of things that they're going to talk about, and over 90% of them were all about competencies of strength and conditioning. And that's great. You've got to be there first. The problem is it's a moving target, right? <laughs> You're competent today, aren't you, son? You're an idiot tomorrow. Unless you what? Take that next step. Okay? Cold-blooded killers are burning the midnight oil right now, being more competent than you. They've taken a step today. Did you? Did I? Keeps me up at night. Competency. Now, some of you are thinking, well, I'm not, I don't know everything. I'm not saying you have to be a genius at everything. Some of you have specific competencies. Some of you are, can be the best in the world at training 100-meter hurdlers. Some of you can be the best in the world at training middle-aged men to lose weight. You have a competency. Okay, don't judge yourself against Einstein. Each of you have a specific competency that you can be the best in the world at. You do. You have it. Okay, so watch the judgment. But do this for me. Don't judge yourself by the hour that you put in. Judge yourself by how much you squeezed out of the hour. And that's something I have to beg from my staff all the time and of myself. Man, I put in a long day. I put in 12 hours. So what? Well, I, got, I put in long hours. I don't care. If you can get the same result in two hours, then do that. Squeeze more out of the hour that you're putting in. Don't just throw a handful of darts at the wall and say, I'm throwing darts, and pat yourself on the back. You're not going to be great, Lance. Okay. Ah, I just don't have time. You've got a computer this, these days that has access to every piece of information, good, bad, ethical, unethical. You don't have an excuse not to be competent. You have an excuse you're watching Game of Thrones this weekend. Don't tell me you don't have time. I don't have access to it. There's not enough good courses that come to me. Lance, you don't have an excuse. You've got to get better today, more competent today. Oh, but I'm going to focus more on quality. Lance, have great quality in quantity. Paradigm shift of thinking, isn't it? Just quality ain't great. And certainly quantity without any quality ain't great. Science and practice, science and practice, walking the walk and talking the talk. Where does winning exist? Out there in that nebulous space. The science is the torch that illuminates where we walk. Make sure we don't step in any cow patties, right? Or step off the edge of a cliff. That's what science does for us. 
What is the practice, your practical ability? What does that do? That's the compass that's telling you where to walk. If I was going to ask for you to walk from here to Houston, which would you rather have, the compass or the torch? Wouldn't it be nice to have both and use them appropriately? The scientist walking around without a compass or the practitioner walking with his head down in the dark. Both are dangerous, aren't they? And both are not great without each other. Winning exists out there. Walt Disney, he had an aspiration to do something better than anybody. He told somebody that when somebody comes to our parks, they're going to feel different when they're in the park. How many have been to Disneyland? Don't you feel weird when you walk out of Disneyland? You feel like you just stepped out of high definition and into regular TV. Don't you? Why is that? Is it because the rides? Is it because the cool costumes? Why is it? It's because of this guy's vision and the people that he's inspired around it. That comes from people. It comes from coaches. Michael was very competent, and he always hung his hat on the fact that he was going to be more competent than anybody else on the track. And that's where he gained a lot of his confidence. A lot of the races he won, he knew he was going to win before he crawled in the blocks because he had done everything in preparation for that moment. There was nothing left to chance. He was highly competent. He had turned over every rock that he possibly could and sitting in the room, he knew he was the cold-blooded killer because everybody else was looking over to him going, that dude did everything. He stayed up extra. It was Christmas, but Christmas was a Tuesday. Tuesday's a training day. We're doing three 300s on Tuesday. And then I'm gonna go home and open presents. Or I'm gonna open presents first and then run three 300s. I took Christmas off because it's a holiday. I bet Jesus was working on Christmas. Okay. So a great coach must also be confident. You're going to see a theme here start to emerge on this ABC. A great coach, Lance, must always be confident. Some swag, right? unbelievable swag. How does that guy have that swag? How does this guy have that swag? He's a complete dork and he still has swag. You got to have some swag. How do you get swag? This confidence? You have courage. You're commencing your initiative. You, this is an action thing. This is assertive. Some would say that you can fake it until you make it. Well, I'm not an assertive person. Fake it. Well, I'm, I don't have a lot of initiative. Fake it. Pretty soon it will start happening. Fake it till you make it. And this doesn't mean you have all the right answers either. You're just open to the questions. Part of being confident, believe it or not, is checking your ego at the door. That's hard for us as coaches, isn't it? We all have big egos of ourselves. Some of you are still having a hard time checking your ego right now. I can see by your body language. That's okay. It's normal. But we got to check it. We've got to have initiative. This was in the urinal of an airport in uh, Frankfurt, Germany. I have no idea why it was in the urinal. I guess people in Germany are having a hard time with initiation on some things, right? But doing things before you're being asked to do it. You want to be great? That's what great people do. They initiate without having somebody have to ask them or remind them. They just do it, guys. We can do it as well. Here's one that we've adopted at MJP, and I got this from some Brazilians. A Brazilian guy asked me, said, are, are you going to the work today? And he didn't know what he was saying. It was a Portuguese thing. It was hard for him to say, but it meant something to me. And he was asking me, I think, if I was going to show up to work today. But what I took it as, am I going to, he's, he's begging me, do I, I need to get to work. Confidence shows that you go to work. That's the hard part, getting up out of bed, right? Go to work. You don't go to work, you get fired, most, ca most cases. But now once you're at work, what do you do? If you're confident, you go to work. You go to work and then you search out where the work is and you go to the work, okay? You all, you all know people, maybe it's yourself, that you show up for work, congratulations. That's great, right? Wrong, that's not even good. Now when you're at work, what do you do? Are you searching for the holes? Are you looking to the work? Where's the work? I'm going to go to the work. And then what happens when you get to the work? Patrick, you work, right? That's what confidence does. I'm going to show up, I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to work. You can do that. That helps you develop confidence. Everybody in this room can do it. 
And you set a great example for your athletes when you do just that. This convicting, Lance, go to work, go to work, and then go to work, Lance. You hear me? This guy's name, anybody know who this is? His name is Sir Alex Ferguson, pretty famous guy. Wikipedia him sometime, okay? Manchester United, longtime manager. I don't know how many championships he's won. Manchester United's a soccer club, for those of you who don't know. It's the number one sports brand in the world. Combine the Yankees and the Cowboys, and it's still not Manchester United, right? So it's a big deal. Pretty successful guy, okay? He sat with me in Doha eight years ago and was confident enough to sit down and tell me, I'm going to send you six guys to train for six weeks. I need them to come back ready to play English Premier League soccer, and for six weeks, I don't want you to let them touch a ball. How about the confidence there? That's a soccer coach telling me for six weeks to take the ball away from these soccer guys and train them as athletes. Talk about confidence. That confidence exudes, it boils up out of him all over his players. Highly successful. A lot of it had to do with his confidence. A great coach must always be committed. Uh-oh, now we're preaching. <laughs> right? The pig, the pig was committed, right? The chicken contributed to that, but the pig was committed. That's commitment. Some of us are tourists, okay? Tourists need not apply for greatness. You know who you are if you're in this room, if you're a tourist, and I'm sorry. Go find what you are obsessed with and passionate about and do that because you will forever be a tourist if you can't align what it is you do for a living with what you are truly passionate about. Okay? This, I love Yoda. You guys know who Yoda is? I'm showing my age here, right? Yoda was a Jedi, right? What did Yoda say about commitment? Come on, Stacy. What did Yoda say about commitment? Commitment is he didn't say that, but that's a nice way of saying it. It's, it. It separates the doers from the dreamers. What did Yoda say? There is no try. Do or do not. You go rent that this weekend, all right? Do or do not, Luke Skywalker. Oh, but coach, I tried. Ah, man, I was trying. No offense, it doesn't matter. Do or do not. There is no try, Lance. You want to be great? Do or do not. Stop telling me how hard you're working. There's nothing so common as somebody telling you how hard they've worked. Do or do not, Yoda. I love it. Here's commitment. This is one of our coaches. He's coaching up a uh, group of 1,800 high school athletes that he's never met before. He will probably never see again as part of a Spark Masters Combine at Cowboy Stadium. It's been some three or four weeks ago now. 1,800 athletes. He goes from 8 o'clock in the morning till about 7 o'clock at night, and all he does is repeat this 20-minute warm-up to prepare them for this combine. 80 kids at a time. This is taken at about noon. He's not getting paid extra for this. He's never going to see these athletes again. But you know what he knows? He knows these athletes need to get ready for a very important event, right? That's commitment. And that's him in the afternoon demonstrating bounding for probably the 18th time with the same energy he did it at 8 o'clock. Okay? If nothing else, that guy's committed, isn't he? Check yourself, Lance. Are you that committed? Could I have done that? I don't know. That's convicting to me. This is one of my guys. That's convicting to me. That's aspirational for me. I don't know if I could do that. All these great words that we use. Are you committed? Are you disciplined? Lance, are you disciplined? Are you dependable? Are you devoted? Do you have great work ethic? You'll never have any of these, Lance, or anybody else, if this is just an interest of yours. I'm interested in sports medicine. Interest does not equal passion. Those are not the same things. I've learned that with great disdain. Okay? Find your passion. And these things will come naturally to you. You're going to hurt. <laughs> it's going to be painful. There will be pain. It's like that movie Saw. There will be blood. There will be pain. But we're all in the strength conditioning. We, we preach that, don't we? You've got to hurt. You've got to do something. you got to get uncomfortable. It's the same with us as professionals. There will be pain. If you're looking for comfort, go to the good room. The door is wide open. They're waving people in. Come be comfortable with the rest of us. The great room has blood and guts all over the wall. It's painful. 
How do I know? Because I've seen a lot of great people. I'm not there yet. I'm standing in the good room looking over there. But I know there will be pains. You're going to suffer one way or the other. You might as well get something out of it. Suffer the pain of discipline or suffer the pain of regret. You're going to go through the pain. You might as well get something out of it, right? That's very convicting to me. Preachers. Anybody know who this guy is? The hip-hop preacher? Love listening to the hip-hop preacher, man. He gets me fired up, man. He has some cool stuff. I have no idea if he's lived it. I have no idea what his story is, but he has some great slogans. Here's some slogans here. If you don't grind, they won't eat. You hear yourself saying this to your athletes? If you don't grind, they ain't going to eat. Come on. The road to greatness. I'm talking about the road to, I'm talking about the road to greatness. Do you want to get on the road to greatness, Luke? Do you want this as bad as you want to breathe? Wendy? Most of you, you value sleep more than you do success. Who are you talking to, coach? Who are you talking to, coach? Anyone you work with. You better yourself first. Lance, before you say any of this, are you doing that? Are you living it? Or are you just piping it? Are you just preaching it? Are you walking it? Or are you talking it? There's nothing so common as coaches with a whole bunch of this crap coming out of their mouths to athletes that they're trying to motivate, and that athlete knows you're selling them a whole sack of crap because you don't walk it, right? Right? This guy was committed. This guy's name's Bill Snyder. If you don't know, read the book. He was my football coach. 1989, he recruits me to come walk on at Kansas State as a football player. Worst college football team in the history of college football. They could get maybe 5,000 people to come to the game and they were all just drunk and just wanted to throw eggs at the players. And he shows me a picture of this stadium that's going to seat 70,000 people, of this new logo, of this new color scheme, of these bowl rings that we're going to win. Huh? I get goosebumps telling that story because he committed us to that. He committed himself to that. When you walk on the campus at Kansas State University and you walk in the stadium, I will swear to you right now, it is the same exact thing that he put on the poster board in front of us in 1989. If you don't believe me, go to his office. He'll show that poster board to you. He committed to it and he got all of us to commit to it as well. Right? A committed culture starts with a coach. A coach of a bunch of losers. We're a bunch of losers. That's commitment. A great coach, Lance, must always be contributional. Okay? The law of tenfold. You reap what you sow. Okay? Great people have taught me that. You do. You truly reap what you sow. You must be contributing, cultivating, a team player, honest and integrity, all that stuff. A, be a steward, a good steward of your resources. Are you just using up the resources that you've been given because you know you're going to lose it? The next year, if you don't use it, be a good steward. The great ones are great stewards. They're givers. They're generous. They're unifying. They're cultivators. Look at this farmer. See the little swath they're cutting into the field as they cultivate their fields? Unbelievable. It's only like 12 inches wide, isn't it? They got a big field to plow. Look in the background. See the fields they're plowing with that thing? Cultivating mentality. Cultivating. Focus. Attention to detail. You think she's griping about the equipment she got? Wouldn't she like a John Deere tractor? She'd probably be a lot, a lot better with a John Deere tractor, right? No. She's got a cultivating attitude. I'm going to take great pride in this swath right here because this could be where the fruit's going to grow. Right here. And that's what's going to feed my family. Being a cultivator. Contributional. I worked for a company called Health South for a while. And of all the bad things you heard about Health South, this was one good thing. It was a great analogy on being contributional. It's the pulling the wagon analogy. Anybody heard of this before? Okay, you're on a team, right? All of you are on a team? The team's objective is to pull that wagon across the finish line. That's your team up there. Where are you on that chart? Hmm? Are you out here on the end? Yanking as hard as you can? You got both hands on the rope and you're putting all your weight into it? Are you back here on the back pushing it? Or are you one of these guys on the side here? That's, uh, you guys need to do this. You need to do that. Or maybe you're one of the people riding in the wagon. What's your contribution? Wagon riders. 
Or maybe you're the guys on here that's sitting down like, that'll never work. You guys are stupid. Where are you at on this chart, guys? Lance, where are you at on this chart today? On this project, where are you at today? Are you contributional? Or are you riding in the wagon? Grab a piece of rope and pull the wagon, Lance. Great ones do that. Great ones are also charismatic. Charisma is like a catalyst. It's like gunpowder. I'm not very charismatic. Fake it till you make it, guys. It's like gunpowder. You're trying to start a fire with your groups? Throw some charisma on there. Boom! This is not charismatic. I'm a strength conditioning coach. And my lifestyle just bleeds charisma with something else. That's not charismatic. Am I saying you have to look like Adonis? No. What are you selling with that picture? Do people want to follow you? Do they think you have a passion? Are you on fire for the profession? Are you an energizer or are you an energy sucker? Is it every day, every play for you? Are you enthusiastic? That's how you get charisma. That's how you get that, that powder keg effect going. The great ones do that. They have a presence. They have this combination of confidence and passion and enthusiasm and authenticity and they're comfortable. They practice it. It's important. Your athletes are picking up on that all the time. Your family is picking up on that all the time. The person sitting next to you is picking up on that all the time. What's your charisma say about you? I have not been around Nick Saban. Maybe some of you have. I've met him one time in my entire life, but I've had a lot of players come from his camp. And one of the things that he talks about, he asks his players all the time, what are you selling today? What's your posture selling about you? Mr. Slumped Over, yawning, checking your cell phone. What's that selling about you right now? You're always selling something. What are you selling today? It's convicting, isn't it, Lance? Whoo! A great coach must also be communicative. Unfortunately, at a lot of these conferences that I've been to in 20 years, those that know won't say. <laughs> and those that say don't know. I've had colleagues of mine, good friends of mine, stand up in front of groups of audiences and show them unbelievable slides of things that they're espousing to do. But they know I'm in the back of the room and they know deep down they ain't doing those things. Okay? They're not being real. We got to be real if we're going to be communicative. When you're being communicative, that means you are a good communicator. You are seeking to communicate. Are you seeking to first understand before being understood? Are you transparent, forthright, and honest? Law of war would tell you that you're the one that's easier to be conquered. Be conquerable. It's going to help you communicate. Are you consistent? Is your nonverbal communication saying what your, what your words are saying? Candid. And are you genuinely considering somebody else's viewpoints? Or are you just waiting for them to shut up so you can start talking? Great ratio. Anybody know what that ratio is? Four to one. You've got four input devices. Two eyes, two ears. You've got one output device. This mouth. Recommendation from a great person? Use them in that ratio. Convicting, isn't it, Lance? Shut up and listen. Be communicative. This guy, anybody know who this is? This guy's name is Arsene Wenger. He's a guy that coaches a team called Arsenal. Again, it's a soccer analogy. One of the smartest guys I've ever been around. He's been there forever, has done unbelievable things. He has won all the championships. He's, he's coached the best players in the world. He spent an hour and a half with me the first time I met him, and all he did was ask questions of me about soccer. You're Arsene Wenger. What are you, why are you asking me? Because he knows it's a chance for him to learn. He's trying to set up communication. He has great communication with his players. He seeks first to understand before being understood. I got an hour and a half with that guy, and I talked the whole time. He maybe asked 10 questions. That's greatness, guys. A great coach must always be creative. This is what I'm working on. We've got to be creative. We've got to discover some things. We've got to look at things differently. Innovate. One of the national uh, speakers at this year's conference talked about innovation. Innovation is hard. It's uncomfortable. Change is uncomfortable, isn't it? 
I'm just going to do what I did in college because that's what I'm comfortable with. Great ones don't. Great ones innovate. He was a great one. Your dreams will come true. Oh, that's so cliche. <laughs> Isn't it cliche? I'm going to break the world record. I'm going to jump out of a pod in space and land on the ground with only a parachute on. Creative, right? Stretch goals. Those folks that are creative, the great ones, embrace and drive change. They're good with change. It's uncomfortable, but they're good with it. They lump it onto their back. They're innovative and they're solution-seeking, not problem identifiers. Don't tell me it's raining if it's raining. I know it's raining. The village idiot can tell me it's raining. Okay? What do I want? If I'm great, what's the great one going to do? Is he going to tell me, hey, look, it's raining. The great one's going to walk in with some umbrellas, isn't he? Or he's going to search for some umbrellas. He's going to be able to identify the problem and immediately click in to be solutions oriented. We got way too many village idiots telling everybody how it's raining, how we can't do it. And we can't do it that way. We can't, well, we tried it that way. We can't do it that way. I'm just going to sit on my hands and be good. The great ones don't. The great ones click right into solutions. I've been around them. I'm not one yet. Lance. Even these guys think you're an idiot. Hey, it's raining. Lance, you're an idiot. This guy, anybody know who this guy is? This guy's name is Alberto Salazar. Guys, you need to write some of these names down if you don't know who these people are. You can learn something from these guys. This guy's a sick individual. One of the best marathoners of all time. Got to work with him on the Oregon Project with Mo Farah and Galen Rupp, Kara Goucher and some of those folks. He came to me five years ago with Galen Rupp, walks him into the office, sits him down, distance runner, 10,000 meter guy, and says, Galen needs to train like a sprinter. Alberto, he's a, he's a distance runner. No, he needs to be a sprinter first. The problem is we've got him so tied into this endurance sport that he's forgotten how to be fast. You've got to have speed before speed endurance. I know that. Well, he's different though. The creativity in his mind initially was craziness. We trained him like a sprinter. <laughs> he changed his entire strategy for training Galen Rupp. He did some extreme things that the running community, any of those of you in the running community know, he was called absolutely, that's ridiculous. He's a nutcase. That will never work. Galen Rupp has done things in men's distance running the last two years, three years now that nobody ever thought possible in the United States. And a lot of that had to do because of Mr. Alberto Salazar's creativity, his craziness, his curiosity, his innovativeness. A great coach must be conditioned. Do we need to look like my friend Benny Wiley? Am I, saying, am I talking about that kind of conditioning? Maybe a little bit. I aspire to be like that. I'm, I'm teaching strength conditioning. I'm teaching people to take care of their bodies. I'm telling them they need to be leaner and stronger. Shouldn't I at least try to look the part? Benny convicts me every time I see him. Does that mean, is that why you have to be do that to be great? Not to that level, but you should aspire for that, right? Yeah? Well, I've got a thing and I've got a, and I, don't tell me about being good. There's plenty of that to go around. Greatness. Are you conditioned? Is this trainer conditioned? Is she getting buy-in from her clients because she's conditioned enough just to demonstrate something? I guarantee she is. Any. But she's conditioned enough to try to demonstrate because she knows these people are probably visual learners. I'm speaking more, though, about reps. I'm speaking more about reps. Getting calluses on your hands. And I'm not talking about calluses from doing barbell snatch. Okay? I'm talking about reps. Real world reps. We have way too many in our profession, gurus, that train one or two people a day and then spend all the rest of the day blogging about it. Okay? Way too much of that in our profession. Guys, if they have that much, no offense, if they have that much time to blog, they're not training as much. Get reps before you become a guru. Experience. This is just some of my numbers I was calculating this morning. I've been keeping a log of all the people that I've interacted with as a coach, directly as a coach. Not just people I met at the mall, but people that I've coached. I've been doing this a long time, 20 years. It's over 40,000 hours of actual on the floor where the rubber meets the road work. 300,000 training sessions. 50 athletes a day is roughly the average. Reps. I've got some knowledge to go along with it. 
But it's the overlap is where it's critical. It's the overlap is where it's critical. I'm not going to stand up here and brag about the degrees that I have. It's useless without the reps. You must press in and get reps to be great. Get reps. Otherwise, you are a tourist. Reps. There will be blood. You think that, that animal right there hasn't learned some things about the real world? If you don't have scars, <laughs> you're not going to be great. Go get some scars. Get in some of those fights. Some of us, Lance, sometimes you think being at the fight is being in the fight. No, no. Grab a gun and get in the fight. You're not getting reps sitting in the Jeep watching them fight. Grab a gun, get out, and get in the fight, Lance, because sitting in the Jeep ain't going to make you great. Convicting, isn't it? But that's tough. There's things in my way that's going to be hard. This guy, you guys seen the movie Gladiator? I'm a movie guy. Marcus Aurelius. You guys know who Marcus Aurelius is from your history books? This is that quote. Things that are in the way are actually showing you the way. I'm scared to death to jump out of an airplane. Guess what, Lance? You need to go jump out of an airplane. What's in the way is showing you the way. It's not there for you to avoid. Great ones, great ones in sport, in coaching, they've learned this. They abide by it every day. What does conditioning do for you? It, you learn more, too. You're only going to learn, really truly learn and apply 10% of what you read on those blogs anyway. 90% of what you do, you will retain. You've got to get reps. You've got to be doing. More reps equals closer to greatness. You've got to swim out in the current. This is a stream. I love to fish, by the way. This is a stream, right? You guys don't know. We have not a lot of water down here. These rivers, that's what I call a river. This water's rushing down here, right? These big boulders are in the water, right? You guys all with me? You ever been in a river, strong current? If I'm a big, fat, lazy fish, where am I going to hide? I'm going to hide behind that rock right there. And let stuff come drift to me. Okay, is that going to be you, big, fat, lazy fish, waiting for stuff to drift to you? Or are you going to go out there and find the strongest current and get in the fight? Those big, fat, lazy fish are easy targets for us fishermen. And once you hook them, they just kind of, they got no fight. You hook one of these suckers out in that current, and he will rip your arms off, even if he's only this big. Because he's been out in the current. He's got calluses. He's got reps. I worked for this guy, sort of. He barely paid me. I don't know what I got paid. It wasn't very much. <laughs> this guy's name is Bill Parcells. And he was a conditioning freak. But he had also been through the battles. He's got a scar on his nose right there. I don't have any idea what that came. He may have been in a fight. You never know. But this guy was conditioned. He'd been through the rigors. And he put us all through the rigors. He would literally love putting you in harm's way because he knows that that's where you're going to learn. He did it to his players. He did it to us as coaches. Valuable lessons from greatness. I hated him for most of that time. Greatness. Always be caring. Last couple here. Compassionate, considerate, other-mindedness. Now we're getting into the softer side of our profession, right? Walt Disney talked about there's three types of people in the world. You're either a poisoner you don't like your life, you don't like what you're doing, and you're going to poison somebody else's because of it. Not as many of those in our profession. There are a bunch of lawn mowers, though. I'm going to take care of my thing. I'm going to mow my lawn. I'm going to let my neighbor take care of his lawn. I'm going to mow my lawn. Or there's life enhancers. They're going to mow their neighbors, help their neighbor mow their lawn first before they come over and mow theirs. Okay, so your, your athletes, if we lined them up right now, or your clients or your coworkers, if we lined them up right now and put you on trial for being one of those three, what are they going to call you? Where's the evidence going to be to convict you? And is there going to be enough evidence to convict you? Well, I think they would all say I'm a life enhancer. Is there enough evidence there? This guy, his name's Mark Parker. Anybody familiar with him? Nike, CEO. He cares about his athletes. At Nike, one of the things you're judged on at Nike as an employee is, are you athlete obsessed? Do you care more about them than you do of yourself? They grade you on this. 
You're hired and fired based on this culture of athlete obsessive culture. Mark Parker at Nike. The last one, a coach must be coachable. Lance, you got to be more coachable. You don't have all the answers. I tried to open up this thing by saying that, right? Ask yourself, are you coachable? Do you give and get? <laughs> are you adaptable? Are you a good teacher? And are you a good student? I met this guy this, this week. Anybody recognize who that is? The guy's name is Drogba. Did you hear Drogba? Just met him this week. Sorry for all the soccer ones. Big time guy, makes 24 million pounds a year. 36 years old, one of the best soccer players of all time. His team, the Ivory Coast, comes to MJP for their pre-World Cup camp. I've got an extern that's been with us for four weeks. She doesn't know what she doesn't know. She doesn't know who this is. And we're doing some core exercises, some, some pal-off presses. And she's over there reading him the riot act on how he should be doing it this way and you need to do this. And What do you think his response is? This? He's letting her coach. What, do what now, coach? Do, coachable. Best in the world. Greatness. And he's being coachable by someone that he knows knows nothing. He knows she knows nothing. But he's going to be coachable. He's going to figure out what... There's something she's trying to get me to do. She's horrible at it. This is ridiculous, but I'm going to get it out of her. <laughs> That's greatness. So there you go, guys. That's my keynote. Always be competent, confident, committed, contributional, charismatic, communicative, creative, conditioned, caring, and coachable. That's my challenge to myself. This is what I have written on my desk. This is what I have hanging on my mirror. This is for me. From what I've learned about being around those that are great, that I aspire to be. I hope that in some way, some way, shape, or form, you develop your own list, and that's what I ask you to do there. Develop your own list, and it may be different from mine, but develop that list and hang it up so that it convicts you to always be what? Coaching. Coaching. Guys, thank you very much. I loved it. I had a great time. <laughs>